Good evening and welcome. The American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy appreciates your participation in tonight's webinar. My name is Ed Dellert and I will be the facilitator throughout this presentation. Our program tonight is entitled Endoscopic Video and Video GIE. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and will be posted on GI Leap, ASGE's online learning management platform. You will have ongoing access to the recording in GI Leap as part of your registration. Before we get started tonight, please note a number of features in tonight's platform so you are aware of many of the resources that are available to you during and after tonight's program. I'm going to share my screen for a moment and take a look at what we have to offer you. On screen, you should see the main lobby of our new platform. You'll see many features that are in here. You'll see our corporate partners that is on the signage on the left-hand side. Um, you will see our banner uh, here. You'll see meeting information, which has our agenda for tonight and some resources uh, related to our topic. Um, you'll also see a satellite symposia from this past weekend's program that's available for your viewing pleasure. You have already managed to get into the auditorium, which is the main, and you can navigate by using a, any of the few buttons on the footer of your screen here. I would call your attention to the exhibit hall. We have a number of exhibitors that are available, including ASGE. Feel free to visit during and after and uh, logging back into this program to visit those sources. We have a uh, resource room where you can, um, if you're into history of endoscopy, you can find resources there for that or meet the masters from our uh, video GIE journal is available to you for your viewing pleasure. Access to our guidelines uh, are available here. If you like gaming, we have some EUS and ERCP games uh, to play around with and then access to GI Leap. In our networking lounge, you will notice that there is our survey for tonight's webinar. Uh, we would encourage you to come here at the end of the webinar and fill this out. It'll only take you a couple of minutes. And then obviously there's some other networking social uh, uh, pieces that you can do with uh, uh, the people participating tonight. You can chat with them and then you can add things to your briefcase. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and come back to our uh, main part of our presentation. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Field Willingham. Dr. Willingham is a member of the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University and serves as Director of Endoscopy and Emory University Division of Digestive Disease in Atlanta, Georgia. He began practicing with Emory Healthcare in 2009. His practice often involves ERCP, EOS, EMR, RFA, cryoablation, and minimally invasive hybrid endoscopic surgeries. His clinical practice manages diagnosis stages and in specialized cases treats a wide variety of gastrointestinal malignancies. Most recently and most excitingly, he became ASGE's Video GIE's Editor-in-Chief in January. It is our great pleasure tonight to have Dr. Willingham and I turn tonight's presentation over to him. Dr. Willingham. Well, hey, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, thank you all so much for, for coming tonight, um, for spending your, your evening with us. Um, we're very excited to talk about uh, video endoscopy and uh, GIE, of course. Um, we're going to look at some videos tonight. We're going to look at some of our uh, highest uh, rated content. Um, I encourage everyone to jump in, ask questions. If there's anything that you want to know about uh, endoscopy um, or producing a video, um, you know, this is a great time. Um, I have uh, invited uh, the um, associate editors for Video GIE as well, um, and we're going to talk about them in, in just a minute. Um, and uh, let me see if I, if I can uh, advance here. Um, let's see, Lyle, have you shared um, control of the uh, screen? Yes, perfect. Um, Okay, so uh, so welcome. Um, uh, as Ed mentioned, thank you, Ed, so much for, for the kind uh, introduction. Um, we are indeed going to be talking about uh, endoscopic video and video GIE tonight. Um, I'm a huge proponent of endoscopic video. Um, I've, uh, it's been a part of my entire academic career. Um, it's a real honor for me to um, to take over the, um, the editor position for uh, Video GIE. And I, I look forward to working with all of you um, on your videos. 
Um, so um, let me just take a second and introduce uh, some of the uh, uh, most important folks at Video GIE. Um, my uh, my my co um, uh, editors um, Ed Despot and Vishali Patel. Um, our, our dear colleagues, um, they're already doing a tremendous amount um, for a video GIE. Um, Dr. Lisa Kasani and Dr. Selvi Thiramurthy are our quiz editors, and so they uh, create the uh, CME questions that, uh, that come from the video GIE content. Um, I'm just so grateful to all of them for all of their work. Um, and uh, I believe they're gonna be on the call tonight and uh, can also answer questions about what we look for in videos and what makes a good uh, video GIE submission. Um, so here they all are. Uh, welcome, I hope, uh, hope everybody's on the call uh, with me tonight. Um, I wanted to say a special thanks to uh, Stephanie Kinnan and Deborah Bowman. They're really the lifeblood of GIE and video GIE. Uh, hey, Lisa. <laughs> Um, and uh, they are the managing editor and the senior managing editor for clinical publications. They are really, really the lifeblood of, of the journals and what makes it all work. Um, so uh, big thanks to Stephanie and to Deborah. Um, anybody know what this is? If you, if you want to, uh, to uh, jump in or, or, or use the chat function, please do. I, I can't actually see the chat right now, but um, this is the, uh, the Dave Project logo. Um, so many years ago, uh, the Dave Project was, uh, was starting at, uh, at the Mass General. Uh, Peter Kelsey and Brenda Bounds um, really kind of uh, launched the, uh, the, the contemporary field, I think, of uh, video endoscopy. And uh, now um, we, let's see, I'm not sure I'm controlling it anymore. Let me see, here we go. Um, uh, and now um, we have Video GIE, which, uh, which uh, I think is really the, the top uh, video journal for uh, gastrointestinal endoscopy. And um, so we're just uh, thrilled to be with you uh, tonight. Um, video GIE is thriving. Um, we um, have more uh, submissions year over year. Um, there were 333. I, I think we're going to surpass that in, in 2021. Um, but uh, a, a great number of, of submissions to the journal. Um, we look at all of your videos, um, every single one that's submitted. Um, there's amazing stuff going on out there. Um, many times the videos, uh, even, even videos that may not get accepted, um, are uh, usually um, incredible uh, works. And um, so we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, about what, what um, creates a, a successful submission. Um, Video GIE is a very active platform on social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and YouTube. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, video can explain things in ways that uh, text cannot. Um, you know, you, you, you could imagine a slide like this being shown at a conference, you know, necrotizing pancreatitis may form a fistula, right? Um, so uh, this would be a pretty typical slide that you might see at a conference. Maybe it's better if you say necrotizing pancreatitis can form fistulas. This is a patient we saw recently with a spontaneous fistula into the duodenum draining some pus. And an image is probably better than a than a word slide. Um, this is a video um, that shows a fistula. Um, so this is a distended papilla right here, and we tracked upwards from there. And this is a spontaneous fistula uh, in the duodenum. You can see it draining some pus there and pus coming out of the major papilla. If we do a sphincterotomy here. Um, and pass a balloon into the bile duct, we're actually able to figure out where the fistula came from. So this is methylene blue injection in the bile duct that's tracking into the duodenum. So I think video has a way of, of conveying a message uh, that uh, words or text or even still images uh, really um, uh, can't um, capture. Um, you know, video, uh, we think it can tell a story. Um, we think it can teach. It's also fast. Um, so our, our videos are three or four minutes long um, and can convey uh, very complicated procedures. Um, the time to publication is another way that they're, that they're fast. So um, you know, we're seeing things in, in video GIE that are not gonna be out in the uh, more typical media um, for many years. Um, so 
uh, remarkable techniques, uh, new technology, new devices, new approaches uh, may all make their launch in, um, in video GIE. Also, uh, I think uh, video, if, if you're going to make a, an academic career in um, advanced endoscopy, you almost have to be uh, involved in endoscopic video. Um, so I think all of these are, are reasons to embrace the platform. Um, this is uh, one of our favorite slides at Video GIE. Um, it shows uh, the submissions by country. Um, we're uh, blessed by a very uh, international um, audience and uh, uh, consumers um, and submitters uh, for Video GIE. Um, about just under half of the submissions come from the United States. Um, so uh, over half are from uh, abroad. Um, which is uh, which is wonderful, and um, we we love uh, seeing all the videos uh, from uh, being submitted from from all over the world. Um, just a couple slides I have for you on uh, some thoughts, um, the some of the pitfalls that we see um, when videos are submitted. Um, patient identifiers. Um, so these um, are, um, are are not publishable or presentable. Um, we, we see this at, uh, at Video GIE. We also see this in videos submitted uh, to DDW. Um, if there are any patient identifiers in the video, um, they, they can't be taken. So uh, you know, be very careful um, and make sure that uh, there's, there's nothing in your uh, fluoro slides and your EOS uh, images um, that, uh, you know, that might uh, give away a, a, patient, um, a patient's identity. Um, be careful uh, numbers sometimes. There are sometimes numbers in, in the uh, EUS images, um, and uh, at times it may not be clear if that's a medical record number or not. So, um, so it's better to block out all the identifiers. Um, I, I actually love endoscopic videos with music, but uh, we, we don't tend to uh, uh, take those for, uh, for academic focused videos for video GIE. Um, another thing, um, we sometimes uh, see videos that are submitted um, and there will be um, breaks in the audio. So, um, you know, there'll be uh, a video playing, but um, there won't be any narration. Um, and uh, in general, uh, you know, our audience um, thinks maybe the audio is not working there or there's been a, 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 you know, some sort of a glitch. So um, we really encourage you to, uh, to talk over the entire uh, video clip or narrate um, what's going, what's happening. Um, uh, a great videos show all of the elements. Um, so if you have some imaging to show, scroll through that. If you're discussing uh, pathology or histology, put the actual slide from your patient up there. Um, gross path uh, from the OR, from uh, resection is also very helpful. You can show stains, talk about those. Um, so really collect all of, the, uh, all of the imaging for your case and include that in your video. Um, and then many times uh, arrows are helpful um, to call out specific features that you're seeing, specific elements of a uh, path or um, things that you're seeing uh, endoscopically. Um, make sure to use the highest resolution and, and get a very clean lens. If the scope is, is high definition, but the, the lens is not clean, it won't result in your, in your best video. Um, some thoughts for recording. Uh, uh, producing a good video um, really begins you know, when you're in the endoscopy suite. Um, it's very helpful to be able to record on the fly. You may never, you may not be expecting something and all of a sudden there's an amazing uh, demonstration. Um, again, use your high resolution. Um, and, uh, and, and some, uh, in some ways we say you know, record um, purposeful sequences. If you turn the video on, record at the beginning of the case, and you just record throughout, you end up with uh, gigabytes of, of uh, endoscopic data that you know you may only keep a, a certain you know um, small segments from. So sometimes it's better to turn it on, record one very clear demonstration, and then turn it off. Um, that'll also um, keep you focused on what do I want to be showing right now: EUS or fluoro or endoscopy. Um, here's a case, and this is actually from the Dave Project. Uh, so um, uh, this was a video. Anyone know what this is? So this is a patient who's having a colonoscopy, 
and uh, this uh, parasite was discovered. Uh, you can see it here. We were fortunate to be able to activate the video quickly. Um, however, uh, we were a little slower with the snare uh, and the endoscopist performing the case uh, was, was unable to grab the, uh, the parasite there. Uh, that was, of course, an ascaris. Um, but, uh, um, you know, mostly we, we, you know, we just show it to, to say, you know, be, be prepared, be able to record uh, on the fly and you will capture uh, some uh, you know, remarkable um, video in your suite. Um, last, uh, the sort of last um, concepts, just some pearls. Um, if you use a graphic uh, to convey um, uh, complex approaches or uh, challenging areas, um, a lot of times that's very helpful. We'll maybe see one tonight. Um, if you use an ex vivo demonstration of a device or a technique or how you set up a, a certain instrument, um, that's often uh, very helpful. Um, it's nice to have a subtle pan and zoom effect. Uh, some some uh, people call it the Ken Burns effect on still images. Um, and think about your transitions. Um, you really you want your transition to communicate um, something to your to your audience, um, but you don't want them focusing on the transition itself. Um, so subtle transitions that um, you know convey a change from endoscopy to EUS, um, but uh, in general, um, avoid uh, sort of loud or, or attention grabbing uh, transitions. Um, and then one thing we see a lot, um, make sure that you um, have included the follow-up and the clinical outcome for the patient. It's even better if you can show the post-procedure imaging. Um, we see um, incredibly complex, uh, amazing videos of endoscopic uh, findings. Um, and oftentimes the video ends at the end of that uh, demonstration. And it's nice to say the patient uh, did well, or you know this was resolved over eight month period, here's the follow up uh, upper GI series or CT scan. Um, so so uh, very important to, to uh, disclose the follow up and, and show um, any relevant uh, imaging. Um, the review process, uh, fortunately, we're very quick. Um, all the credit goes to the associate editors. Um, the uh, submission to first decision um, time has uh, decreased. It's now just under 18 days. So that's a very quick platform to publish your work in. Um, so, um, you know, please, uh, uh, you know, think about your cases, submit them to uh, Video GIE, and, and we will get you a turnaround uh, very quickly. Um, we also um, we also try and um, take a lot of the uh, work that's submitted. Um, you know, some there are journals that are you know really accept 10, 15 percent of their submissions. Um, we uh, want G, uh, video GIE to be very inclusive. And um, so we have uh, uh, tended to take um, a lot of our uh, submitted work. Um, so again, um, you know, think about uh, preparing your, your cases and, uh, and sending us a, a video um, and we'd love to uh, review it. Um, so here are uh, some of our top uh, videos. Um, I asked uh, our uh, publisher to uh, pull um, some of the most accessed content. Um, this is a video uh, from uh, England and uh, Japan, and uh, it is uh, one of our most uh, accessed for uh, 2020. Um, and I'll just uh, play you uh, some of it here and, and kind of talk over it and uh, and uh, call out some of the things that make it really a, a standout. Um, so they've they've got a, a, their title slide on there. Make sure your title slide in the video agrees with the title slide of your uh, manuscript submission. Um, you may be able to hear them uh, beginning to speak in the background. They've done a nice job um, with the disclosures here. I wanted to mention um, this slide where, um, where you um, indicate your instruments. So, uh, you know, um, uh, give the details as they have here, you know, what exact instruments were used for the case. Oftentimes this is very helpful. The, uh, the audience um, that is viewing the videos is oftentimes very sophisticated and, and this is uh, helpful for them to know exactly what was used uh, during the case. Um, loss of orientation. 
So uh, this was a case, um, it's a sort of complex method um, to resect uh, large um, rectal neoplasms. Um, it's a, an ESD approach. Um, and the authors have done a, a very nice job um, demonstrating their, uh, their work. Um, here's a diagram uh, that you know, kind of walks you through um, what is a, a very complex uh, approach to an ESD. Um, so you know, I think a diagram like this at the beginning um, can really help orient the viewers um, and can really add a lot to, uh, to your submission. So uh, think about including a diagram, particularly if the uh, topic is, is complex uh, and, uh, and difficult to explain. Let's see. Uh, not giving me the control element. Here we go. Um, so um, they presented the case here, um, and then we can walk through just a little bit of, uh, of the video. Um, this is uh, demonstrating the uh, submucosal dissection. Um, you can see the, the video here is, uh, is high definition. Um, it's very clear. The lens is clean here. Um, so they've done a nice job of, of editing out um, the, uh, the submucosal the, uh, segments where you can't see what's going on or where the, the lens is not clear. Um, and they're describing this method of, uh, of a butterfly dissection sort of uh, starting on, on either side of the uh, of a, a platform or a piece of tissue um, underneath a, a rectal tumor. Um, so at the distal end of So here we go. Um, are, can you guys hear uh, the audio? So um, this was a great demonstration, I thought, of, uh, of a, a very well done uh, video. Um, and uh, this is another example here. Um, this video is from uh, Hyderabad. Um, and it's a bilateral balloon expandable biodegradable Y stent. Um, so this was uh, also some of our uh, very most accessed uh, content. Um, and it's a very nice uh, demonstration of several things. And I'll try and uh, play it for you here. Uh, so uh, the disclaimer, make sure to include your, your disclaimer here. Expandable biodegradable stand for post cholecystectomy perihilar biliary stricture. Can, can you guys hear the audio? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, they've included their uh, their disclosures, and here's the equipment that was used. Twenty six year old uh, female underwent complicated laparoscopic cholecystectomy, leading to biliary stricture. Well, the clinical ago. part of the case. He required multiple ERCP sessions with balloon dilatation, along with incremental plastic stents, without resolution of biliary stricture. Baseline cholangiogram showing perihilar biliary stricture. This is a nice demonstration. The current caught image shows modalities. bilaterally placed plastic stents. Includes your fluoro, includes your ear. He was considered for a definitive therapy in the form of biliary balloon expandable biodegradable stent placement. So the fascinating concept of showing biodegradable stent. biliary balloon expandable biodegradable stent tightly crimped over a deflated balloon. This is an ex vivo image depicting stepwise stent expansion using balloon dilatation based on recommended pressure depending on stent diameter. So here they've done a nice job of including this is some an ex vivo, vivo demonstration demonstrations of balloon expandable biodegradable stent. This is a really nice this example. Following video of depicts stent and stent an ex vivo example Y formation across a hyla structure. So this is a model the for the bifurcation. Across the hyla structure after adequate balloon dilatation. They're going to leave Another a wire in place. Guide wire there. is placed across the mesh of the first stand. After calibrated balloon dilatation, the second stand is placed through the mesh of the first stand. And this is how they create the, the Y stent 
uh, draining both the left and the right. Presently, this tent is not FDA approved. A helpful, a helpful comment. Coming back to the case, the block plastic stents were removed. Cholangiogram showing multiple filling defects. Balloon sweep cleared multiple soft stones. On subsequent right hepatic duct cannulation, multiple filling defects were seen with persistence of perihyla stricture. So it's nice that they've gone back and forth from endoscopic Introduction to of first biliary balloon expandable biodegradable stent into the left hepatic duct. So they're placing the first biodegradable stent here. Cholangiogram showing expanded radiolucent biodegradable stent with radio opaque markers at upper and lower end of the stent. Another guide wire was negotiated through the mesh of the previously placed stent across the right hepatic duct stricture. Balloon dilatation was done to allow the stent assembly to pass through the mesh of the first stent. Second, balloon expandable biodegradable stent placed across the right hepatic duct stricture. It's a fascinating concept. Post procedure right? fluoroscopic image showing radio opaque end markers of the stent and aerobilia. Patient did well post procedure. CT scan done 24 hours later showing opened up bilateral stents. Presently, at 8 weeks post-procedure, patient is asymptomatic with improved liver biochemical parameters. And that's nice follow-up. Standard endoscopic treatment options for binion biliary stricture include incremental plastic stents or fully covered self-expandable metal stent. Placement of fully covered self-expandable metal stent in hyla stricture can cause contralateral blockage of the biliary system. Biliary balloon expandable biodegradable stent BEBS offers a promising therapeutic option in this subset of patient for adequate biliary drainage without the need for additional procedures to remove or replace the stent. So this is a, a great video showing a, a fascinating approach. Um, it's a, a very nice demonstration, uh, mixing uh, imaging, uh, cross-sectional imaging with fluoroscopy, with endoscopy. Um, they gave uh, follow-up, um, showed how the patient was doing um, uh, sort of subsequent to the procedure. So um, this is a great, a great demonstration and, and one of our most uh, accessed uh, videos. Uh, so let's see. Um, here is a, another very nice uh, video. Um, so, uh, you know, this is um, also one of our most accessed uh, videos. Um, this one is from Japan um, and it's showing a really a novel um, concept. Um, so the, the, the procedure itself is, um, is straightforward. They're really just talking about biliary cannulation. Um, but it's a, a conceptual method of uh, visualizing the, the bile duct and uh, assisting in your cannulation. And so um, let me show you this uh, video here. A novel teaching tool for visualizing the invisible bile duct axis in three dimensions during biliary cannulation. Compact this method. Selected so biliary cannulation is difficult to master, even in cases with normal papillae. In the cases of a papilla with a long oral protrusion, the difficulty is greatly increased. In such cases, visualization of the invisible bile duct axis in three dimensions is required, but is difficult to master even for experienced endoscopists. Individual trainers must commit to developing their teaching skills, however, 
There is no dedicated teaching tool for this difficult task. Therefore, we have developed a novel and simple teaching tool for recognizing the invisible ball duct axis in 3D called the compact disc method. First, the trainee must imagine that a number of CDs are lined up in the oral protrusion three-dimensionally. In cases with a normal papilla, one CD is imagined. In contrast, in cases of papilla with a LOP, several CDs are imagined. CDs were imaged at the horizontal direction of the several transverse folds of LOP. It's a nice use of graphics. Next, to form an image of the invisible ball duct, the trainee should imagine that a line runs through the center hole of each imagined CD. In addition, the CD should be imaged a slightly offset when viewed from the front of the papilla. Again, this is going to be an ex vivo Manipulation demonstration of, the of their concept. Through the center hole of each imagined CD is a similar movement to that in the adjustment of the axis of invisible bisect in cases of LLP. The trainee can become proficient in adjusting the invisible ball duct axis in LOP cases by the accumulation of affected feedback using the CD method. Typically, the trainee is only conscious of the hole in the papilla and not the ball duct axis. On the other hand, an experienced endoscopist can recognize the nearby bile duct axis, but cannot imagine the bile duct axis at the back. In contrast, experts can imagine the invisible bile duct axis at the back and adjust the bile duct axis by manipulating the catheter through the hole. The CD method can be summarized using the following schema. First, CDs were imagined at the horizontal direction of the several transverse folds of LLP. Next, the endoscopist should assume this proper scope position such that the CDs of the papilla and catheter tip are face to face. However, despite the good position, if the endoscopist pushes the cannula with force, the bile duct axis of the LOP bends easily. The endoscopist must manipulate the catheter slowly and gently through the hole of each imagined CD. Likewise, when wired guided cannulation is performed, if the endoscopist pushes with force, the guide wire can easily damage the bile duct. The endoscopist must manipulate the guide wire slowly and gently through the hole of each imagined CD when wire guided cannulation is performed. The imagined invisible bile duct obtained by the CD method can contribute to proper and gentle guide wire manipulation with wire rotation under fluoroscopy. We now show how to provide feedback using the CD method. First, the endoscopist should imagine a CD on the papilla. Next, the endoscopist should assume the proper scope position such that the CD on the papilla and catheter tip are face to face. Here, the CD on the papilla and catheter tip are not face to face. The CD on the papilla and catheter tip are not yet face to face. The endoscopist misunderstood the orifice of the papilla. The endoscopist changed the endoscopic view and the direction of the CD on the papilla changed slightly.
The CD and the papilla and catheter tip are almost face to face. The CD and the papilla and catheter tip are finally face to face. However, the imaginary line connecting the CDs and the oral protrusion clearly shows that the axis of the catheter and bile duct are not matched. The endoscopist changed the axis of the catheter to adjust the axis of the invisible bile duct and the oral protrusion. Selective deep biliary cannulation was successful. When performing ESD, the adjustment of the bile duct axis by CD method allows for a safe incision direction. So this is a nice demonstration. They've put some text up here. Um, they're uh, describing what they're doing with each step. Um, as you see, it's not, uh, um, you know, um, remarkable or novel technology or a new approach, but um, it's helpful for uh, teaching about cannulation and about understanding your orientation. It is simply based on imaging CDs. Without and words, it can be used in any country. So this has been a great uh, video um, and uh, one of our most accessed, probably um, folks uh, wanting to learn more about um, a straightforward approach to cannulation. Um, I see my colleagues on here, Ed and Vishali. Um, that they are also here, um, able to answer questions. So um, if, uh, if they would like to jump in, uh, you know, please feel free. Um, and we also have a question from the audience. Um, would someone be able to speak a bit more about preferred programs for uh, video editing? Um, I will tell you, um, it seems like a lot of our videos now are coming from um, iMovie, um, from, uh, you know, from a, a, a Mac platform. Um, I would say um, uh, that is uh, one of the most common uh, now that we're seeing. Um, Vishali, Ed, you guys have any uh, any other thoughts about, um, uh, yeah, Lisa saying she uses iMovie. Um, if Ed and uh, Vishali have any comments about um, about programs, um, you know, they can uh, they'll, they can also um, share it with us in the uh, in the screen. Hi, Field. How are you? Hey, Ed. How are you? Not bad, thank you. Not bad. And Thanks for joining it. us. What, what so, time so is it? Things. It's a quarter to one here, but oh, that's dear. absolutely fine. I'm a night <laughs> out. So really educational. This is phenomenal, honestly, taking us through all these fantastic videos. And uh, it, it highlights how, how important the educational value uh, can be raised by adding some little touches, uh, especially graphics or diagrams. Really, really cool. Um, I, I play with iMovie, um, uh, but I've also dabbled with the more serious ones, such as Premiere. Um, uh, in the olden days, I used to use Windows Movie Maker, which is really, really simple. I don't think it's available anymore or it's difficult to, to get hold of, but I think iMovie is, is stable. It's easy, it's nice, and it contains all the proper features, I think. Excellent. Um... Hi, Pia, uh, how are you? It's hey, Michelle. Michelle, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, I agree with Ed. So iMovie seems to be the most popular. And then we've also seen um, MP4s come through as well. Um, so it, you know, I think I would encourage people um, not to just use um, their iPhone to record something and then use that video directly because it becomes sometimes not as clear, might be choppy, and the image quality sometimes is not as good. So definitely transfer images over to one of these programs um, to allow for better editing as well. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent point. Can I add something, Field, regarding sure, video capture? So uh, some people ask about video capture. How do you do it? I mean, of course, you can invest in the medical devices uh, if your unit can afford it. But uh, a trick that we found early on, um, uh, which allows us to record high definition, uh, are these uh, video monitors that um, producers use to actually see what's happening on the proper camera when they're filming a movie. Uh, an example um, of a proprietary one, if I may mention it, is something called um, Blackmagic. 
video assist and uh, it's it's really cheaply available it's less than 500 pounds uh, which converts to about four hundred dollars i'd say and uh, and it's really really useful and it's very easy to plug into any any um, type of uh, you know um, scope or or a processor Absolutely. Um, uh, great points. Um, there's another question coming through. Um, how do you instruct your GI fellows today in using video in their training and then throughout their career? Um, well, um, our, our fellows, particularly those that are interested in endoscopy, um, are very involved with video. Um, we um, encourage them to uh, create videos and to submit videos. Um, it's oftentimes the fellows that put together um, some of the most uh, remarkable uh, demonstrations of uh, different techniques that are going on in the lab. Um, I think the process of creating a video is then invaluable um, uh, in, in uh, crafting presentations. You know, obviously some video is submitted for publication to a journal like Video GIE. Um, but a lot of video will become a part of your PowerPoints and your academic presentation. So it's really a key skill uh, to develop during fellowship that um, is going to um, stay with you, um, especially if, you, if you're going to end up uh, in a career in advanced endoscopy. Um, so um, thank you so much for all the questions. Keep them coming. Um, this, I think, is the last uh, video I have for you this evening. Um, this one's from the U.S., um, it's called Every Trick in the Book, EOS Angiotherapy. Um, uh, and it's, a, it's just a really terrific video. It goes through a number of uh, remarkable techniques um, and does a very nice job of, uh, of using multiple modalities to uh, demonstrate a point. Um, so I'm gonna uh, just play it for you here. And um, uh, we'll see, there's their disclaimer again. I'm skipping through a little bit. Um, there's the title again. Um, important to make your disclosures at the beginning, particularly if, if some of the technology is used in your video, and then uh, include a detailed um, list of your equipment. A like gastric bypass and a perforated duodenal ulcer, initially presented to RED with melanic stools and hypotension. Can you and guys hear the audio? He demonstrated a normal esophagus, normal gastric pouch, and normal jejunum with no evidence of bleeding seen throughout the entire examination. Following the procedure, the patient had no further bleeding and was discharged. In the coming months, the patient was seen at different hospitals for recurrent episodes of GI bleeding. Extensive workups at those facilities were also unable to localize the source of bleeding. Five months after his initial presentation for bleeding at our facility, the patient came back to our ED. This time, in addition to having melana, the patient also was experiencing severe right upper quadrant pain. An urgent CT scan revealed that the patient had a very distended, excluded stomach and a duodenal perforation. The patient subsequently underwent an X-lap and had a gram patch for management of the perforated duodenal ulcer. Four months later, the patient again came back to our ER after having recurrent bleeding and a syncopal episode. An urgent EGD was performed. Similar to our prior endoscopy, no blood was identified in the gastric pouch. The scope was advanced to the jejunodejunostomy and from there, a blood clot was seen coming from the pancreaticobiliary limb. Following the procedure, a CT angiogram was performed and demonstrated hyperdense material in the excluded stomach, suggestive of a blood clot. So notice they're going through uh, multiple sections of the scan. Um, so that's a nice demonstration of the imaging. The was made to endoscopically access the excluded stomach. Here they've gone back and forth with endoscopic and EUS video. Access and expanded with a mixture of contrast and methylene blue. Subtle transition. A 15 it's not millimeter, jarring. Millimeter fully covered luminous opposing metal stent was used to create a new jejunal gastric anastomosis between the blind root limb and the excluded stomach. To avoid stent migration or dislodgement during the hemostasis procedure, the lumen opposing metal stent was sutured to the adjacent jejunum using two 2 proline sutures. Yet another technique. Only a few seconds, so they're suturing the coaxial stent in place. Just a few seconds of the video. The stent was then dilated to 18 millimeters. Did a nice After job going back and forth between the different modalities. The gastric pouch. There, a large blood clot was seen and was eventually cleared from the stomach. 
Brisk bleeding was found to be originating from the duodenal apex. Twenty cc's of dilute epinephrine was injected. Then, two hemostatic clips were placed over the site of bleeding for the purpose of localization in case future interventions were needed by interventional radiology. So this is a nice point. Um, IR can see with fluoroscopy exactly where the video or where the bleeding is coming from. So in case they needed to embolize it later. By 60 millimeter, fully covered metal stent for a tamponade. And so they've left a stent in place. And a concern for a pseudoaneurysm. Later that evening, the patient was taken by IR for a mesenteric angiography and an attempt at hemostasis. Again, showing all the modalities, so, even yeah. the ones that are not Apparently, traditionally yeah. within our specialty. There was advanced to the common hepatic artery, but that was also unable to select the GDA. Given persistent bleeding overnight, surgery was consulted, but they recommended against any intervention due to concerns of a hostile surgical field. Thus, Gastroenterology was reconsulted for another attempt at hemostasis. First, the previously placed stent was removed. Then, with great difficulty, the therapeutic EUS scope was advanced through the lumen opposing metal stent and into the duodenal bulb. There, a 1.8 millimeter arterial vessel was seen extending into the ulcer bed. This was thought to be a branch of the GDA. Arterial flow was then confirmed using our EUS processor. Important to check these screens, make sure you don't have any identifiers here. Once we had confirmed the location of the arterial vessel, it was targeted with our EUS needle. We then injected two coils and a mixture of gel phone and epinephrine directly into the vessel. You had a really nice demonstration of a, a CT scan was difficult technique. Demonstrated that we had successfully coiled a branch of the gastroduodenal artery leading into the ulcer bed. Following our last intervention, the patient has had no further bleeding. And a nice description of the follow-up. Several weeks later, we brought the patient back to our endoscopy suite to reevaluate the duodenum. After passing through the lumen opposing metal stent and the pylorus, we entered the duodenal apex and found the ulcer that had been bleeding previously. Compared to the appearance from the prior endoscopy, the ulcer appears to now be healing. And really nice to show all the follow-up, the video from the endo, from the follow-up. The impact and vast array of therapeutic interventions available to endoscopists. In complex cases where interventional radiology and surgery are unable to achieve hemostasis, therapeutic endoscopy with intravascular treatment may be an option. So this is really nice, a uh, really nice demonstration of multiple techniques. The video is very short, um, but it goes through a great many approaches. Um, They've gone back and forth between uh, the fluoro view, the uh, EOS view, the endoscopic view. Um, the audio was well synced. Um, so this is a very nice uh, demonstration of a very complicated and interesting case. Let's see. So, um, so that's it for the videos. Um, I just wanted to say, um, you know, uh, uh, the road ahead for video GIE, um, I'm just going to mention just a few things that we've been talking about and uh, working on. Um, there are several different things that, uh, that, we're, that we're, we're having the works right now. Um, and I'm just going to briefly mention five of them. Uh, the logo, the website, the social media, the DDW integration and uh, the new content types. Um, so first the logo, um, you may recognize the logo. This reminds me of uh, a bank of CRT images here. You know, it's kind of retro. It's kind of focused on the video, um, which has served us well. Um, and we are gonna be 
you know, taking off from there and trying to focus on the endoscopy part um, of, uh, of, of the video GIE. And um, so uh, stay tuned for a new logo, hopefully coming soon. Um, we wanted to leverage and synchronize our opportunities with DDW. And so um, we are going to work closely with the groups that are um, leading uh, the video forum and the World Cup and the online learning library. And um, we're going to try and do some simulcasting actually with uh, the video forum uh, on Video GIE. Um, we are going to uh, look towards publishing a, a Video GIE supplement of the videos that are accepted to, to DDW for the video forum or World Cup, um, uh, just as abstracts accepted at uh, DDW become published in a supplement of GIE videos accepted uh, to the key events at DDW are going to be um, published in a video GIE supplement. Um, also, um, there's going to be a video GIE award uh, at the plenary session, so we're very excited about uh, DDW. Um, new content, um, so we're going to be um, creating some new content categories for video GIE. Um, just like a, a print journal may have a review article, um, we want to create an opportunity for video review articles. So instead of showcasing the most remarkable, amazing, groundbreaking procedure, um, we want to cover some content that may um, explain um, standard approaches to uh, interventional um, endoscopy conditions and, and disease states. Um, so we, uh, we're, we're going to allow um, submission of these and we're going to invite um, experts in the field as well. And we think there'll be a lot of interest in uh, some uh, review, review type video articles. Um, we are also going to create some patient facing content. Um, so if anybody wants to uh, submit um, content uh, to, that's oriented towards uh, patients. Um, so polypectomy, what is a polypectomy? How does that work? How do you prep? Um, tell me about a colonoscopy. Um, we think there may be a lot of great demand for, um, for video that's uh, really focused on, on our patients. And we're also working on uh, industry generated content. So um, this will be um, labeled and vetted and reviewed, um, but we think it'll be a place where um, you can go for specific manufacturer recommendations, complex animations uh, to see approved device and cautery settings. Um, and so uh, all these are new content types that we're going to be um, incorporating uh, uh, ahead. Um, so that's all I have for you this evening. Thank you for staying late and, and spending your Thursday with us. Um, I uh, wanted to open it uh, up for any uh, questions. Thank you to everybody who's, who's commenting uh, in the chat box. Um, if you have any questions for me or for uh, Vishali or Ed or uh, any of the uh, video GIE staff, uh, please, um, please jump in now and, uh, and ask. Um, and I think uh, Ed may also have a few, um, a few ASGE comments uh, as, we, as we close it out. <laughs> Let's see. Is, is there any plan of starting editorial fellowship for trainees in video GIE? Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, we, uh, we have a, a very active review panel. Um, we have a editorial review board. Um, and so um, if there's anybody who is really interested in working more with us, um, we would be delighted to um, to work with you um, on, uh, on, on being more involved with the journal. Um, I know um, Vishali and Ed are always looking for good reviewers um, and, and great reviewers uh, become uh, uh, members of our editorial review board. Um, so uh, please do reach out. Um, Vishali has just shared uh, some, uh, uh, some of our uh, Twitter uh, handles and um, contact info down there. So uh, please, please do reach out uh, and we would be uh, delighted to, uh, to have you more involved in the journal. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Willingham, for being here with us tonight. Uh, um, and, and thank you, Dr. Patel and Dr. Despot for, for jumping in. I appreciate you staying up late. 
Before we close out, uh, just a quick reminder, I do want to uh, let you know that your experience with these learning events is very important to ASG and we want to make sure we are offering interactive sessions that fit your educational needs. Uh, please do go to the networking lounge and uh, take our survey it takes less than two minutes to complete uh, and we greatly appreciate your, your feedback. Um, as a final reminder, please do check ASGE's calendar of events as we will continue to feature relevant sessions uh, to our Thursday Night Light series. In fact, our next webinar will be next Thursday, April 1st at 7 p.m. Uh, and the topic on that is pros and cons of pursuing a fourth year fellowship and it's sponsored and facilitated by the ASGE Women in Endoscopy Special Interest Group. Uh, please do plan to attend that one. Um, in closing, again, Dr. Willingham, Dr. Despa, Dr. Patel, thank you so much for being here and thank you all to, to the attendants for, for being here as well. Um, we hope this information has been useful to you when you practice and with this, uh, we'll uh, conclude our presentation for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.